Honor, Mr. Sunil Kashikar, VP, Resource Management Group, Zensa Technologies. I would like to call upon student manager Arushi Upadhyay to introduce our guest. Success seems to be connected with action. Successful people keep moving. They make mistakes, but they don't quit. Good morning all the dignitaries on and off the dais and everyone present here. I, Arushi Upadhyay, student manager, Balaji Institute of Modern Management, have immense pleasure to introduce Mr. Sunil Kashikar, Vice President, Resource Management Group at Zensa Technologies. Mr. Kashikar has done his BSc in Physics and Computer Programming from Mumbai University and is postgraduate from Velga Institute of Management. Sir has over 30 years of experience in the field of human resources. He has started his career in Blue Star Limited and was associated with the companies such as Aptec Limited, Flickon Multisystems, and Tech Mahindra. Mr. Kashika is a specialist in vendor development management. Beyond that, a solid ground forming has out beyond that, a sales and marketing and business development of hardware and automation products. Mr. Sunil has been an inspiration for every colleague you get to work with. He is a pillar of support and his charismatic character helps to deal with the tough and critical situations in a magical way. Now, I would like to invite Sir to share his words of wisdom. Sir, the podium is all yours and pleasure is ours. Thank you. Uh, so am I audible to everybody? That's nice. Uh, Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to first of all thank Colonel Balasubramaniam, uh, Honorable Chief Guest, uh, my colleague uh, Venki, as we fondly call him. I think he's just left. But I'm thanking him because he laid a solid foundation for uh, today's uh, session. And of course, the uh, members of the faculty and board of the Balaji Group, and of course, my fellow students and friends. Uh, I call you my fellow students and friends because I am also a student. Uh, in spite of whatever you heard about me, I am still in the learning phase in life. But I think I have learned some part of it which I will be very happy to share with you. And uh, while Venki has given a very strong foundation to the uh, challenges in the business environment, and I am sure you noticed that uh, as his talk progressed, he went more towards the human capital management or we are talking about talent and we are talking about leadership and all those challenges. Uh, while I also belong in a way to the HR fraternity because uh, my function rolls up under the HR head at Zensar. But I would like to take you through a little bit of the technology part of it which is basically because I am from Zensar Technologies. So I will give you a technology flavor. Uh, linked to business challenges. So I'll give you a little different way of looking at the challenges we have in the business uh, environment today. And uh, one thing which heartened me uh, to see in the previous uh, session is that uh, most of you are very interactive, you are uh, open to asking all kinds of questions and I just love that environment. And with that, it also encourages me to actually kind of go through my session a little faster because I'd rather listen to some of the questions and answer them to the best of my ability because as I was telling Arushi on the way here is my personal belief is uh, lecture sessions can always be had but sharing experiences, telling you stories will something is something which you will always uh, remember the session by and it will also be a takeaway from these kind of sessions. So. Uh, without much ado, let me get into the uh, business environment and I am not making any bones about it, we are going to talk technology. And when we talk about technology, we are not going to go into the, uh, we will talk about the applications of technology and how they address the business challenges of today's envir uh, business environment. So what are we talking about? Uh, Venki did allude to the fact that nowadays all companies are getting into new business models. Now whether it is a startup culture, whether it is a services culture, whether it is a B2C, 
e-commerce, I mean these are all names which you all are very familiar with, but essentially the biggest challenge is every company to survive has to reinvent itself. It cannot stay on what it was doing all this while, all these years, all these decades, they have to reinvent themselves. So to reinvent themselves, they have to redo their business model. Uh, obviously, there are two basic tenets of business and one of them is, and very un unashamedly this was taught to us is, why are people in business? Can anybody answer that? Why are people in business? Yes, I can hear that to make money. I mean, there is no other tenet. You cannot say, I want to be service of society and all, don't kid yourself. You are in the business to make money, that's one. But you can survive in business and make money only if you have customers. So customer is the most important factor in your business. And today's customers, unlike the previous, are very demanding, they are educated, they want a choice and this kind of alludes to what uh, Venki was saying is that today B2C, B2B, all those things are why? Because they are keeping the customer at the focus of their business plans. Customer, if customer is not there, you are not going to make business, as simple as that. So customer centricity is a major tenet and if you will see across organizations, this word is used either in their vision statement, it could be in their mission, it could be in their goals, but customer centricity, customer satisfaction, customer delight, you will hear all these buzzwords. That's the reason why it is there. <clears throat> and of course, now that you have decided, A, you want to make money, B, you've got the customers lined up, C, is you have to have the products, or you have to have the services, you have to have the innovation, something which will attract, hook the customer to come to you. I mean, uh, just about two and a half years back, who had heard of uh, Ola? Nobody had. Today I'm sure most of us have the apps and everybody's talking about it. As a matter of fact, Ola has created in India such an impact that it is being talked about even in the international community, while Uber is already there. But they are already talking about this. And they are also talking about the innovation which has happened in India, which I can just share with you is well, I just traveled abroad a month and a half back, so I can share with you directly, is India is amongst the few countries where these two service providers accept cash as payment. None of the other countries where these two service providers, Ola and Uber, exist, take cash. Now, why? It's, it's the, way, the customer. Yes, it's the way we handle our credit cards versus cash. Indians are per se a little more conservative in sharing credit card information and loading cards and you know, Ola money and everything else. So most of the time it is a cash transaction. So they have innovated themselves. So this is what I'm talking about. With us as a product or service, you have to innovate. So <clears throat> to transform the organization and your business plans, everything has to be, you know, continuously innovated. Whether it's the way you communicate to the customer, whether it's about your services or the way you actually conduct your business, Everything has to be innovated and I'll talk about how it is done. So this is the good part. Okay, that are all the nice sounding words like customer, increasing business, making money, all those things, improving your innovation quotient, etc. But how about some of the challenges? Because to do this, for everything that you do, there is a challenge attached to it, right? Nothing is easy in this world. As uh, some of you asked some questions which I was keeping in mind, is about the innovation and startups or why is it that startups are folding so quickly and uh, Venki had some answers to that. So same thing here is what are the challenges getting into there? Important point is work, your regular work is increasingly becoming complex. Now please for those of you who uh, will, you know, I don't want you to retreat into a shell and say, oh God, this guy, I'm just going to start up my career and he's saying work is getting complex. I don't want to work, I'd rather go and do something else. No, please, let's not get into that way because these are facts of life. There is a certain benefit, work is getting complex, but when I say work is getting complex, that's a motherhood statement. It is also having some stars around it. It's to help you address your work, there are lots of ways of going about it, right? The, the time when I was educated at, at this level, uh, everything was only on books and reference and library, period. 
there was nothing else. Today, what do you have? Loudly, loudly. Google. There you are. I mean, you have Google. Forget it. Everything is available on that. We didn't have any of that stuff. So, we had to make efforts. Sometimes we had to even go to libraries of other colleges, borrow books through one of our friends who worked in the other's college because that college library had a book. Our college did not have a book. So, these are some of the challenges. But today, work is getting complex. But to help you along that, you are getting additional technology to work for you, etc. The other one is, uh, and this is more actually towards the software industry, but it is can be generic across, is we have to start getting multi-skilled. There was a time when you could only be a standard mechanical engineer, okay, who understood only mechanical engineering, how to build, you know, machines, gears, uh, you know, things like that. Today, you have to develop specialized skills. And that's the reason we have to continue not only as a company to innovate, but also ourselves. We also have to innovate our own selves. So here, is, here are the reasons why. Here is the reason why. Why am I telling you all these things? Is because today customer expectation and work culture both are changing and they are both happening simultaneously. How do I put it across? Customer's expectation from us, our own organization's expectation of us. The work culture is changing. So, if the work culture is changing, we have to keep continuously changing ourselves. And how do we do it? How do we go ahead and change it? There are two basics which are at the bottom of the, uh, the base of the pyramid. One is through automation and one is through multi-skilled roles. So, automation is obviously for whatever we do today, we have some automation, whether it's your app, whether it is your computer, desktop, laptop, computing device, whatever have you. Automation is there. What about, uh, have you heard of NFC? Yes. So, you are now, it's making it easier. Earlier, you had to have a card, you had to swipe it. Now, you don't have to swipe it. You just have to flash it across the reader and that's it. The data gets transferred. Similarly, on the roles of people, now this is coming to the little bit of the people side, is today you have, but you're also taught uh, certain other uh, in our company, the HR people also become business partners. Okay, so that means they get a flavor of the business. They not only look after the employee engagement part of it, but they also understand the business. Reason being, tomorrow they have to deploy people across geographies, across uh, territories. They have to understand what the business plans are. So that is one. So those were the overall things on which I am going to base my discussion upon is as I said, work is going to become more complex. Yes, work is going to become more complex. Today, there are people who are handling multiple roles. So, not only are you handling your own role, but you're also handling something new, some new project because organization expects you to do that. Business expects you to do that. And obviously, you will also grow. The more you take up, the more you will grow. So, here it is. These are the work arounds. These are the facts of life. If workloads are increasing, what are we doing? What are we going to do? We are going to seek help with your colleagues, your teams, cross-functional teams. That's how cross-functional teams are formed. Because I'm sure even for this event, which you all have very nicely organized, there would have been cross-functional teams working together. If there was only one person running the show, he would have been in serious trouble. So you have a group of people collaborating and based on their own skill sets, they are contributing towards the common task and achieving success. That's a very simplistic way of saying it. Similarly, what I'm talking about is that when you are working in organizations, there has to be collaboration between the two. These words should stick by you. The reason I'm telling you this is because these are some of the qualities which we look for when we are looking at hiring people. Is, is this person a collaborative person or is he work, used to working in a silo? Is he a specialist who doesn't need help, but he is an individual contributor, but he will do only these set of tasks? Or is he a person who is flexible, who can work in teams, who can collaborate and get work done? These are some of the qualities. And that's the reason why I brought this up here, because these should be important learnings for all of us. The other part of it is that the amount of data which is coming our way, I mean, just think about it. 
when you bought your first mobile phone to today, how many apps have you loaded into the mobile phone? I mean, it's a very simplistic thing. It, it, it resonates commonly with everybody. When you first got your phone, and if it was not a smartphone, you didn't even have an app. But today, when you've got your second or third phone or whatever smartphone, how many apps have you loaded? How much data is coming out of those apps? I'm taking it at a very simplistic, common level like you and me all use. Now, transport this into an organization. Transport this into an organization where there are computers, internet, the works, you've got machines, whether it's in the production, factory, if it's in the software engineering side, how much data is coming? So every day we are getting bombarded by data. Today, a lot of people I know have kind of given up reading newspapers. I know all of you, I heard that all of you have some time to read uh, Economic Times every day, right? But in the industry today, people have kind of given up reading newspaper for two reasons. Number one, availability of e-newspaper. So that's one part of it. The second, and this is more important, e-newspaper is all right. The important part is people do not have time to read the newspaper. <coughs> so they do not have time because they are rushing to office, rushing back to office. Uh, people like me who are sitting on late night calls or early morning calls, where do you have time to read the newspaper? So you stop your subscription and start reading the e-newspaper, which is what again? It's data. So it's all basically data overload which is happening in our systems today. Earlier these things were not there. These are the changes which are coming up across. And of course the important point connected with what I just said in the previous sentence, because of global interconnectedness, you are not only getting data from your local time zone, you're getting data from all over the world. So whether it's news, whether it's updates, whether it's corporate updates, whether it is your stock market, NSE, Brexit, uh, Trump, whatever have you, everything is coming from across the world. So important thing is we must all realize that we are getting into a situation where there is a continuous bombardment of data. You, me, all of us have to then prioritize what is it important for us and what is not. So that is a challenge which we have. These are some of the challenges which we are talking about in the world. The second part, and obviously connected with that, everybody, today everybody is in a hurry. Today everybody has got shorter timelines. Today customers demand quicker service. There are companies who are trying to outdo each other on service delivery times. We deliver in 48 hours, we'll deliver in 36. We will deliver in 24 hours. So I'm saying that's where it is. So, and obviously when they're keeping the customer at the focus of their business and they're making these commitments, it flows all backwards into the organization. Whether it is a services organization, whether it's a service provider, whether it's an integrator, whether it's a manufacturer, whatever have you, Lack of time is biggest challenge because of these. And if you really look at it, this is all a challenge of the business environment. If today a company owner decides, I cannot stand this concept of lack of challenge. I'm going to slow down my services. I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to tell my employees, do it whenever you feel like. If you just cut down the pace, and what is going to happen? What is going to happen? Any ideas? Besides people being very relaxed, what else is going to happen? That's right. You're going to shortfall. There will be a shortfall in your demand fulfillment, which will mean what? That's right. Dissatisfied customers, which will lead to shutdown of the business. That's it. So today, the business environment demands that we have to be on top of our game, on top of our, on the tips of our toes, as I would like to say. We have to be all the time aware of what's happening. You have technology, but we have to go on ahead. So here's the help. Lack of time. Yes, we know that. But we have technology to help us. So when we have a lack of time, what do we do? If I do not have time in a meeting to take notes, what do I do? I just take a snapshot of the uh, meeting notes which someone has written on a chart. I'm not going to sit and make my own notes. Whatever I say, I'll just take a snapshot, take it home, I'm done. I mean, that's a very simplistic example. But what I'm trying to say is that technology is there to help you. Uh, Venki uh, talked about 3D printing. So how, much, how many of you are fully aware of what is 3D printing? So 
yes I can see a few smattering right. So, 3D printing is a expensive piece of technology which is now slowly as it is being assimilated across the manufacturing it is basically used in the manufacturing industry it will find its uses across the remaining spectrum. It is an expensive piece of technology, but it is cutting down time to market of various products when specially there is a new product which they have to be launched like in the case of Seat tires they came out with a new truck tire. Now, if they had to go through a normal way of designing the tire and then getting uh, prototypes made and then you know getting it quality checked and it had to be done through a supplier and then get the rubber and all the stories behind it the prototype tire may have taken anything between 6 to 10 months. Now, they got hold of a 3D printer, they got the epoxy and the rubber and whatever have you to create the tire, they could do it in less than a month. They created the tire, yes of course, because you are creating a prototype there will be mistakes, there will be defects, you got to correct that, but then time to fail and recover is much faster. So, there is a there is a cliche which is used in the industry which is called fail fast which means if you got to fail, you should fail fast and recover out from it, which if you hear some of the theoreticians talking about in philosophy is if you are running a race and you fall down and get injured, most people will look after their injury and sit down on the side. Idea is get up and as soon as possible and try and complete the race. So, it is a very simplistic way of looking at it, but what we are saying is you have to use technology to fail fast. If you cannot do it, go to the next level discover your failures, learn from it and then get into the success mode. And this is a survey which was done is a lot of time uh, people were asked ok you have reached this level, you have reached that level. What is your biggest problem which you are having and obviously people who have reached a certain successful level, a certain level in life many a time there was a survey done that what is it that is lacking, you got the money you got the power or whatever that goes with that position, you have the recognition from the public or the organization, you have teams working under you. What is it that is lacking? What is it that is lacking in your overall portfolio? And everybody says I do not have time, that is the only thing and you may have read in some of the forwards in the famous WhatsApp uh, philosophical quotes which keep flowing around is that is one th only commodity which you cannot buy is time because time is only 24 hours a day and multiplied by 365 days and all those stories, but basically that is something you cannot buy whatever you have in life. So, time is one thing. So, to enable us to get out of it what we need to do which I alluded to previously is collaboration is crucial. Important thing is you realize you on your own cannot do this, you have to rely upon a team which, we, which means you have to get on to a collaborative mode, get hold of your team talk to them about it, share and that is the reason why today in uh, organizations like ours for every project we have multifunctional teams, teams which are good at their doing their own stuff, but we create teams together which will help us achieve the outcome much faster. So, teamwork is important, teamwork has to be it is a fact of life and by the way from the HR angle, from the HR angle they also differentiate between skills of people management versus individual contributor. There are two different distinct tracks in our company which we follow is, is this person a people's manager which means does he drive people as teams and collaborate or is he a singular or a individual contributor. Obviously, the individual contributor have their own benefits, they are typically subject matter experts, you got the you know the PhDs in material sciences, now you cannot have a team of so many of them but he is the subject matter expert and he is required for the business. So, you have subject matter expert, but the collaboration has to be driven through the people managers. <coughs> and why is collaboration crucial which I just mentioned one is this is second thing is that it is also a way of creating when you create team you create bonding. As uh, Venki had talked about top uh, talent attraction, talent retention one of the important facets of HR is building cross functional teams which increases collaboration, which increases engagement, which increases stickiness or it reduces attrition. So, these are some of the philosophies which are thrown about and obviously, there is a meaning to it that is the reason why we are talking about it. 
and important point is that in functions nowadays organizations have also figured out that if you cannot get talent right you look for people who are on what you call freelance basis the concept of contracting the con contractual uh, hiring has become more and more important earlier this concept was not there but today you have people who work by the hour by the job by the duration or by a uh, by completing a certain task you can hire people according to that and earlier there was some social stigma attached to it which said that oh he is contractual guy he is not fully employed all those stories are there but today there are people who are subject matter experts or who have the experience who work on a contractual basis they work part time it's nothing wrong with that everybody is getting into that so i think we are reaching the halfway no we still have some time uh, technology skills as i did mention is that we have to gain technology skills which is learning about automation learning about robot robotics and our uh, my colleague venki did mention about the millennials as we described all of you and not us it's you who are the millennials so basically you all have picked up technology much faster and i think this is one challenge and i would like to uh, state one important point here there are some companies who have now started doing this very what they call reverse mentorship you are all familiar with mentorship i am assuming what is mentorship give me an idea quick so yes so you have some senior persons who is a guide for you when you are joining as a fresher that is standard it's de facto now they are having reverse mentorship that means there are junior people being assigned to senior experienced folks as a reverse mentorship to give them a view of how the younger generation thinks and operates i mean i have seen it with my own eyes that some of our youngsters like you are teaching some of our senior managers some of the latest stuff which is available on the on the apps etc they are doing that because the elder people are not used to that they are using them i mean it's like a grandson teaching the grandfather how to download an app on his phone it's something like that so this reverse mentorship is gaining a lot of uh, importance in organizations that we are getting the younger millennial workforce to actually educate the older workforce in certain areas where there are challenges i'm sure all of you recognize these two fellows yes so most of you have seen the terminator series and of course the iron man series i think the terminator series are a little more favorite with the guys and the iron man is more with the ladies if i'm not mistaken it's because of the personalities associated and the men who act as them okay but that's fine that is by the side so here are the two different perspectives which we are talking about is we are talking about basically the terminator series which talks only about machine non emotional non thinking machines these are just computerized models which have been humanized and that's how they will work so that's why the terminator perspective is it's only about machines the machine has such a quality that he can do he she i mean he can do everything he is you know all powerful all tough all everything else so if he the terminator is there you don't need mankind to do anything but the other perspective of this whole thing is that the technologies which go with the iron man now do you see what i'm trying to get at okay is there there is a human angle to it iron man is basically a human being but his skills his abilities are being augmented by technology so as soon as he puts on all those uh, you know armor suit and everything else he becomes like a superman i mean he is capable of achieving superior feats so there is a difference while terminator is a machine made man iron man is a man who uses machines to uh, function like a machine so some of these tools can be harnessed effectively that that's what i'm saying is today i'm just coming to the next one which is a very interesting part of it is uh, we talked about iot are you aware of iot yes so great so we will talk about some of the applications of iot and that's where the man machine interface starts becoming a little more seamless and then we will go to augmented reality which we will discuss about 
Oh, uh, where are we? Huh. So that's exactly what I said. What are these technologies? Let's take a quick look at these technologies. So I'm now talking only technical. What are the technologies which are being used today by the industry? And I'm not talking only IT. I'm talking about across because even a manufacturing company today has an IT group because they are using technology. Today machines have got sensors which are using technology and giving live feedback about the machine condition. As a matter of fact, Zensa Technologies is working with Seat Tires, which is a group company and Venki was talking about it. Seat Tires, what are we doing? We are using technology to actually look at the state of the tire once it is fixed in a vehicle. That means there are small chips embedded in tires which actually give out information about the status of the tire, when it needs to be changed, etc., etc. So there it is, manufacturing industry still using technology. We have machines which are making the uh, tires, the machines give you details about how it's functioning, what's the efficiency, when does it need to be serviced, etc. So there's your second part of it, is that companies are using cloud. Now, so we will go to these three or four tenets of this. Everybody understands cloud? What is cloud? Everybody understands cloud, nice. Can you define what is cloud besides the actual physical phenomena of weather? What is cloud? Right. So it is a virtual storage. But uh, do you realize that finally that virtual storage is virtual to you, all of us, the users. But actually, is there some memory residing in the air? If there's anybody who said yes, I think you need to recalibrate yourself. Because finally, data has to be stored on some media. So there are what they call server farms across the world. Okay? They could be as far away as Ukraine or they could be in Singapore, they could be in Spain, they can be anywhere. They can be in India, Bangalore, for example. These are server farms which are basically just oceans of memory which are leased out. You as a user do not know where it exists, in whose premises, what is the address, you have no clue. It's a virtual thing for you. So for example, Google has got its own server farms. Why? Because if you realize, Google has got terabytes and terabytes of data which you all are all accessing. Everything on the, what they say, the cloud. But finally, the data has to sit somewhere. It is sitting on the server farms. So that is what is the concept of cloud which I wanted to clarify to you is yes, it's cloud because it is very dispersed. You don't know where it is. You don't know once you look up, there's a cloud. Next time you look up, it's not there. So it's the same concept is it's somewhere there. You don't know where it is. You're only some of the service providers are paying for the service. So that's why it is called cloud. Mobility, everybody is very clear about. I don't need to even discuss about it because you guys are all experts at using your own mobile phones, you know what is mobility, you know what it is all about and data available as you move. Big data and analytics. Now, while analytics is very well understood because it is a English word and you understand it, what is big data? What do you, no, please, big data is not equal to Hadoop. Hadoop is a technology. Big data is a concept. So that's where I want to sort that thing out. Hadoop is one of the technologies which basically manipulates the big data. But what is big data? Yes, that's right. It's simplistically, it is exactly what it means. It is a huge collection of data. Earlier, data could be measured in kilo bytes and then kilobytes and then megabytes and then gigabytes and then terabytes and it just continued. So what's happening is earlier when you wanted to ask for some data, you could get it in the form of just very small amounts of data. Today what you want to ask for data, you will get trillions of data. That's why it's called big data because it gives you all kinds of parameters even if you don't want it, but it's there. Now you use Hadoop as someone said or some of the other analytics to give you some meaning out of the data. If I gave you an Excel sheet which ran, you know, this big with all kinds of rows and columns with data in it, would you be able to figure out what's going on? You will not. You will just see lots of data. But can you figure out something out of it? No. You have to use an analytic tool, Hadoop, Pentaho, all these kind of things to, uh, what's that called? Business objects. What is? 
that's right you have to put it together to give you a meaningful report or you will be able to see what is the analytics all about social media yes i will talk about that a little bit because uh, you all discussed it during the previous session one of the points was that you all discussed about social media and related to hiring now i run the hiring function in zensart okay so i had a perspective which i wanted to put across to uh, someone out here who asked about how how do companies use social media for making hiring decisions so yes venki very rightly put it across that it is only an aid to making a decision it is not the decision so typically linkedin is your professional platform which we look at we look at your cv everything else is fine but we also look at what is it that is being done and here is where i'm stating the obvious what is it that you do in your free time because a lot of companies are build i'm sorry yes facebook and twitter so okay twitter it gives us an idea as to what are the areas of life which you are passionate about you will not retweet if it doesn't interest you am i right so it's only something which is close to your heart you will retweet it similarly when you go to facebook we can analyze the social profile also not only the professional profile which is more on linkedin but the social profile and if you want to ask me specifically what we look at we look at what kind of connects do you have who are the people who are your people around you what kind of people do you fraternize with are you fraternizing with media politicians only friends only college friends you know so we come or only professional are you following professional associations because there are professional groups also in uh, facebook so that is how we see we look at a person who is a passive a passive social media person is a person who is only looking at it there are hardly any posts the last time i looked at it his his or her post was about a year back so this is a person who is a passive person while there are other people who are the totally the opposite side they are the hyper posters you know we call them hyper posters because they keep posting every day every minute every hour they step out they take a photograph put it in there they look out they see rain is not there they'll say rain is not there so you know there are the hyper posters so we look at that also but i'm saying these are the ones which we look at to create a overall profile and off late what we have started doing is whenever we do leadership hiring the hiring manager not only gets the cv and the interview assessment sheet of the viewer we also give a social media profile that this person is besides all the professional stuff this person is also a avid traveler avid reader these are some of the things which are may or may not be important but these are pointers which we give so i said these are the ones which help us they will not make the decision they will not make the decision but they will help decide on what you want to hire so that's what i wanted to talk about on the social media now the last two these are the latest and that's why i kept it for the last and permit me i'll just have a quick soft uh, drink of water cyber security and internet of things so these are the two latest entrants to the overall digital the digital world is the last two okay so what is cyber security the name is very simple cyber security what is it security in the internet right but what is so important about it? correct yes that's right i could hear different words but i think you got it what it is is essentially cyber security is because of the literally the profusion of data on the internet most of it public domain most of it connected with you and i which is our personal data there has to be some kind of cyber security measures in place to ensure safety of the data can you imagine if you did a bank transaction or you did your uh, amazon transaction and when you decided to pay for it online there was no security for your uh, card details obviously the results are obvious so that's a very simplistic way of saying it but this is we are always looking at it as individual tomorrow think about the bank transaction which is taking in millions of dollars banks are overnight transferring money across the continents different banks payment gateways everywhere if there was no cyber security that's it and what is more important is not only is cyber security they are also looking at do you know the concept of ethical hacking 
how many have you tried ethical hacking? Not too many. So, the, you are the pure technologists who are uh, at work here. So, cyber uh, ethical hacking is part of the cyber security because what they have realized is immaterial of whatever the types of anti security, anti virus, anti uh, spam, whatever have you, all kinds of uh, cyber security, there are still a certain group of people who are always out to try and break those codes. And that is the reason why today cyber security is becoming very important and just for you specifically, the demand is slowly but surely increasing because companies especially in the banking and insurance and the finance sector, they are realizing that all their platforms especially if you realize amongst technology, banking platforms are some of the oldest platforms today and they are slowly migrating into the new ones. But they are the ones which are most prone. Earlier banking did not have security because there was no concept of hacking and everything else. But today you have that concept of cyber security for pre uh, precisely this because banks are migrating data, they need to build in the security layer. So, that is very important. So, that is your cyber security and finally internet of things. So, let me now this is where I want to get because this affects and will affect our daily lives. What is anybody's understanding of internet of things? What do you think of internet of things? Please. Ah, please, I. Devices communicating to each other. So, that means you are not involved with it. Okay. Anybody else? Connected with the humans. Communicating with the humans. Okay, what else? Okay, so let me enact a small little thing for you just to give you an idea. Just let me, when I say enact, I am not going to act, but I am going to just take you through a scenario. So imagine that today you, your house, your home, uh, your car, your everything is internet enabled, app enabled. Okay, so what happens is that you have enabled your technology in such a way that in the morning, now you are sleeping, in the morning your alarm bell rings. So, typical, I mean it is a very human thing, everything happens, you got to go to work, your alarm rings. As soon as your alarm rings, you turn, you do not even have to turn it off because the alarm is set on a certain program that after 5 rings go into snooze mode. So, you do not have to turn it off and then the next snooze mode will be a louder alarm till you shut it off, small no internet, nothing, this is just the same thing. However, however, here is your thing, what if the way, as soon as the first alarm bell rang, your geezer in the bathroom came on, your second alarm bell rang, your geezer has now heated up water for you, so there is your one scenario, you get out of bed, you go into the bathroom, your water is heated up for you. Please do not forget that when you shut the alarm off from snooze to completely off, at that time your coffee machine in the pantry or whatever started heating up water. Now you are in the bathroom, you do brush and everything else, you go to the kitchen and your coffee has already started coming through the coffee, uh, coffee grinder or coffee machine. So, here you are. Now, do not forget your water is still hot in the geyser, you have gone to the thing, you have had your coffee, all right. They still have not created an internet of things for the lady of the house to make breakfast for you, but that will happen soon enough. But okay, so you have your breakfast, you do everything else and now you are ready to get ready, get ready, go and have a bath. While you are having a bath and now this I am just taking it to the extreme extent in a very cold country like the US, uh, especially in areas like Boston and again Dakota, these are some of the coldest places there, you typically have to start your car engine much before you leave the house, even though your car is parked in your internal garage, because it is so cold that the oil starts getting frozen. So, here is the deal, while you are having your bath, you have programmed the system, your car oil sump which heats, the, warms the oil comes on, because you have programmed it. Okay, by the way, where is this programming happening? Any ideas? Where is the programming happening? So, 
where are the systems for it? There are only two parts, very simple. We just talked about internet, right? It's IoT, Internet of Things. What are the things? All these things I'm telling about. How are they connected? Internet. Through what? Your app. Your app has already done everything. Now, you've got ready, you've had your breakfast, you go into the car. By the way, I saw this happen myself, is uh, just when I was in the US uh, recently, is I saw one guy, we were in his house and he moved towards his car and he just pressed some button on his car remote. You know what happened? Three things happened. The car started automatically without him in the car. The garage door automatically opened without anything else. The garage door opened, electronic. The car started. I was surprised to see that. I said, oh, so you can start your car from there. He said, yes. And then third one, this is interesting. He has the car keys in his hand, car keys. So he walks towards the car. And by the way, it's one of the latest BMWs. He goes close to the car, the door opens is proximity detecting. The car keys in his hand and it is with him. So I said, this is fantastic. I mean, you don't even have to, I mean, in a way they make you lazy, but I'm saying everything is automated. The car door opened. So I said, what would happen if you did not have this key? So he says, you try it. So he took the key and went away there. He shut the door, went away there. I went and stood in the car door and I tried to open the door. The door wouldn't open. So it does not allow anybody else besides the key holder to open the passage or the driver side door. Now this is important for you to know. This is some of the things which are happening in this. This is all internet of things. And he says, I can do this sitting in my office. So these are some of the things of internet of things which is happening. Another application which I'm seeing is uh, going to come here very soon because the Refrigerators are being equipped for that. It is coming in the next three to five years, but it will come. So there is a gentleman who's in the at ho, uh, in the office. He wants to go home, and uh, he cannot figure out what was it that he was supposed to buy from the grocery store. He was supposed to buy something. Can't remember it. Does he have enough milk in the house? Is the bread lying somewhere? He has an app which connects to the refrigerator. And the, the app tells him through sensors what are the things available in the fridge. So it tells him that the location of the milk, there is no milk bottle. He knows he has to get a milk. Where the, free, uh, where the bread is kept, there is no bread. He knows he has to pick up bread. So I am saying, of course, now you see the words which I am using, where the milk is kept, where the bread is kept. That is the intelligence. You, because you would want to know, how is this being happening? Very simple. There are certain fixed areas for this. That is how Internet of Things works. And as we speak, I do not know if you are fully aware, but we have Internet of Things coming to Pune in the newer residential townships which are being built. And you want to know how? Does anybody have any idea? Okay. Home automation. Yes. Now we'll come there. You are at the brink of it. So home automation we talk about is typically what? Since you say home, what, what is automatic about home automation? So the moment you come inside, the lights will switch on and based on your pressure and your fan and according to the temperature, the temperature automatically Okay. So motion sensing. Motion sensing, yeah. So it uses motion sensing technology. Okay. So lights come on. Okay. What else? Right. Right. So it's basically a concept of integrating of four or five types of devices without wires. That is very important. You can, this technology was available many years back, but you had to wire the house accordingly. Today you don't need wires because it operates on a, a combination of radio waves, internet, and the intelligence of the device. By the way, there are multiple things, that's good. I am glad that at least some of you know about it, but there are multiple things. Nowadays, the houses are going to be, they're coming with door locks, which have got biometrics. So you have a door lock, so as long as you come into the house or someone else is there, you put your thumb in there, it will open the door. If anybody else tries it, no. 
and also you also have keypad that is i think now common is you have a keypad you just put a code the door opens similarly a person inside the house as soon as someone is putting the biometric it activates the camera inside the house so if someone is in the house they can see who it is outside because there is a camera outside so these are some of the ways and that's happening in pune by the way there are builders who are coming out with these ready made inbuilt facilities and same thing you from the app you can see by the way one more important part on security there are sense gas leak in the kitchen so they have got sensors on that so if any of those things happen if a gas thing business leaks if someone forces open the door if a window is shattered because of whatever reason the system gives you a trigger on your mobile phone wherever you are it's to the net that is internet of things so i think we spent a fair amount of time uh, on the on this part what happened to my internet of things ah. here we go so i think i wanted to give you a perspective of what are the various aspects of technology which are going to which are already impacting us and they are going to impact us even more and we have to be ready for it now the latter part of it which is just another couple of them because i know we want to finish off in time so machines joining workforce everybody has heard of it some of you have seen movies uh, about you know uh, robots and automatons and whatever have you but yes for a fact the in for example everybody has heard in japan the uh, toyota factory is using robotics to assemble cars so that's an interesting part even the factory in chennai has started that so it's coming to our doorstep now we have robotics every car is being assembled by a robotic a uh, by a robot sorry so here it is it's basically i'm just giving you a, uh, an idea is look at the second last statement which is there which is at mit which is one of the uh, seats of learning or the seats of r and d they have said that an industrial robot can be trained now this is where it is coming closer and closer to the human way of understanding things is that by observing the habits of a worker it just replicates it every time once the robot has learned that a human worker does this and does this for every piece which is coming the robot will also follow exactly the same thing okay but that's still happening we still got to get there and the final part the final part of this whole piece is ai so we we slowly graduated from automation to robotics now artificial intelligence and finally of course we'll see what happens so you all remember terminator skynet you know all those words those are the real buzzwords but basically intelligent machines if you see it was in 1955 they had figured out that this is what they are going to do but today we are much ahead than that robots is obviously part of artificial intelligence but you are also hearing about the small bots well i don't know what they call them bots but things which are at home which do stuff for you today they have already discovered that they can do small small things like they can go around cleaning the house on their own you just program them they will go they have sensors which give them direction they have the gps positioning so they go around the house clean up the house on their own sorry defense sector yes because wherever it is a highly critical area or there is a dangerous area or there are those landmines and bombs and whatever have you they send the unmanned vehicles as they call them this is all part of artificial intelligence which is basically learning from repetitive jobs by the machines so of course ibm watson everybody knows about that and i don't think we need to get there uh, on that and finally important point is while it sounded very ominous that uh robots join the workforce but they will as of now not kill jobs that means jobs there was a lot of uh, worry about this hoo ha that uh, if robots come in people will be on the road people will be jobless because robots have come and taken over the job no that's incorrect that statement is not valid as of now but i cannot say what will happen 5 years down the line so basically we are talking about enterprises are understanding this and they are what they are doing and we are we've started that very small at zensar is smaller software jobs which can be done automatically are going to be done by robotic machines okay while those people who are doing those jobs will get cross trained onto something else so it's not that people are going to get jobless it's just that it's going to be a shift in the workforce upwards that's all 
and the simplest job is on basically the uh, robots which will be doing the repetitive jobs. And this is the last part, promise after that my monologue is done, the augmented reality. So, is this something which you people are familiar with? Yeah. So, basically it has something to do with something you wear, wearables. Uh, so, we have augmented reality goggles where you can actually see, actually you can simulate what you would be seeing. And I will give you a very simple example because I do not want to get into the technology part of it. Here is the here is your Google Glass and also I am just taking it ahead. So, there was this exhibition I, we had created ourselves in our own laboratory where we took someone on a tour of a house and the house was not there, it was all here. So, what we did is we were giving a demo of uh, augmented reality and uh, what we had done is we had asked people to come in, wear the goggles and as soon as they wear the goggles, we just turn them around, before putting the goggles on we turn them around, we say ok now watch, what are you looking at? And we actually took them on a guided tour of a house and it was all visible only in this, if, if they took it off it would be in the office. Now this is something which we are talking to builders, today what happens? Builders, A by the way from, from experience we all know builders are people who got money they are willing to spend because they are dealing in real estate, they are selling houses or homes or flats or whatever have you. So, what happens is that these builders, there are two ways of doing it, one is expensive brochures, inexpensive CDs but expensive to produce or number three is fussy people who do not want to go to the site immediately. You tell them oh you want a, a flat in Wagoli, you will have to go to the site visit. Now, people are not very comfortable with going for on site visits immediately, especially at the initial stages, they would rather go there when they are ready to pay. But otherwise if they just want to go, who is going to go there? So, this is one solution is they can go to the customer's house with this glass, put it on, turn it on and show them how the flat is going to look and it is literally, I mean if you, you feel like, I have seen it myself, you feel like touching the wall to see whether it is real or not, but you know it is not there, but that is how augmented reality is and this has got tremendous application in everything, whether it is defense, whether it is in manufacturing, whether it is in retail, whatever have you, augmented reality. I mean just a, on this off the record, how many of you ladies when you want to have a haircut, it is a very important part of your grooming, but there is always a concern how will I look after the haircut, is that correct or no? and you will almost invariably never be able to figure out how it is going to be, but what if you wore this glass and you saw yourself with short cut, long cut, this cut, that cut and say oh ok I like this, then let us go for it, you can do that. So, these are some of the just I mean this is just on the side, but these are very easily replicable in an, a laboratory. So, finally second last slide, this is second last, so this is just a summary slide, so you do not have to worry about it, it is basically it is Im important thing is with increasing globalization, the business challenges are increasing, we have to use technology to help us, anybody whose technology or anti-technology is going to be having a little bit of a challenge handling the, the situation how it is and finally, talent is going to become necessary for every function which needs these skills and machines will not take away your talent, so let us be very comfortable with that idea, with that thought. So, with this. I say thank you very much uh, and now if any questions you have please, we did some interactions, so please go ahead. Yes. Hello sir, I am Arjun from operations batch, uh, BIM. So, uh, apart from the mechanical, mechanical automation that is going on right now, yes. in recent days if you see even in the Indian software technology companies, yes. the software automation is getting started up for the simple monotonous work also and they are also using bots with artificial intelligence for complex works, even they are starting to do in the hiring process. So, and with that given that TCS and Infosys have reduced the intakes in the recent times, hmm. so what does it take on this and such automation uh, like have you taken any such steps in your company, automation in hiring or like in softer side? So, uh, we are working on some of the softwares which are leading to automation, 
we have not reduced our hiring right now and uh, the simplistic reason if you are concerned about TCS or Infosys is they have reduced their hiring at that level only because they are right now experimenting to see whether the automation solutions which they have created are able to be replicated without the human intervention. They are not taking a chance because obviously industry is very competitive, cost pressures are there. So they do not want to hire a person as well as have the solution and then see which works because there is an investment in the person. Technology is one time, but once you take a person, that person is with you for regular, uh, regular work. So what they are doing is certain areas and this is especially in the infrastructure management space where there are certain desktop stuff like for example, you installed Windows 10, Windows 10 or 11 or whatever, wherever we are and there is a problem. Today what happens is you pick up the phone and talk to a service desk employee. What they are doing is you can talk to an, now here there is no machine sitting there like this. You are just talking to a software package which is sitting in the machine which picks up the call, understands your question. It has already been programmed with a set of standard FAQs you may call, call it Chabits. and obviously gives you standard answers. And they expect over a period of time for this to be improved more and then come up with more lateral thinking on what it could be. So it could be this or that. Right now it is only set of questions or FAQs, set of standard answers. So they are experimenting with that. Okay. Yeah. Hello, Good sir. morning, sir. On your Hello. Yeah. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but that would be the last question. Thank you. I'm sorry, I think I, oh, uh, I overshot my brief. Uh, yes. Yeah, sir, definitely. Sir, I'm Rahul Rawal. I'm from... Yeah. Sir, uh, I'm Rahul Rawal. Uh, I'm from BIM. Uh, I was working uh, on uh, in a project uh, in C8 uh, from the last two months. So I was working on the radial tire technology. It is a new product. You must be... Uh, uh, no, no, knowing that. So uh, one uh, problem we faced uh, while launching this product is that how to uh, tap the ruler market because uh, you, as you know that the 70% of the India is living in rural India. So uh, these people are not technology centric. So if we are launching a new product uh, and the rest of the 30% of the India, uh, we have a saturation. Uh, we have a, an yeah. N number of the tire companies. So uh, how to... Uh, 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 gel up the technology, how to launch a product um, uh, so that uh, we can tap the ruler market and how we can familiarize that product to the um, um, to that 70% uh, of the population in India. Because okay. that was a live example we were facing while I was working in CA tires. So this is two wheeler you are talking about? No sir, LCV tires, four wheeler. Oh, LCV tires, yeah. four wheelers. Okay. So basically it's like this, uh, as part of your product launch strategy, see, there would have been some thought gone into why they have developed this kind of tire for a specific vehicle, for a specific market. Having said so, there needs to be some strategic thinking is that okay, as you said and at your level if you are able to understand this, the higher level definitely understand that if 30% of a market is in urban areas and 70% is in rural areas, then that 70% is a bigger market and they need to attract that 30% market, they know they will be able to handle it. It's a 70 percent which is the one which they have to handle. Now important thing is, yes the education and awareness levels of the LCV users in the rural market is not so high. They have to then educate the dealers. There has to be a process by which technology is slowly cascaded down the line which means that when an LCV dealer has been educated about the <coughs> benefits of this technology, he has to be fully familiar with it. Having done that, he has to then go down to the next level and explain it to the person who is actually coming to buy the LCV or the LCV tire because finally what will happen is obviously it is going to be at a slightly premium price. So the question is that guy is going to ask why should I pay you more for the tire? He should be able to explain why this tire is better than the others because of the technology embedding in that. So there has to be a certain phased rollout so that you can make the dealers understand and then communicate down the line. It should not be the manufacturers job to educate the public. The so public is not there. What I felt that there is a certain limitation to the technology because any we can't imply the technology to each and every person. Agreed. So it, is, it has its own limitation. So uh, any 
uh, what I uh, concluded uh, out of the situation that we have to educate uh, our own customers first. They, they have to be uh, at that level so that we can just uh, convey our message through the technology, uh, through the technology to the um, uh, targeted customers. Correct. Yeah. I think that's, that's the right thing. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Your views in technology and being, that being linked to challenges was insightful, especially how innovation and redoing of business models was concerned, and also how products and services are provided to customers, whilst collaboration and gaining new technology skills being the most important in today's era, especially with machines and artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you, sir. May I now request Dr. Suresh Chandrapadi, Director, Balaji Institute of International Business, to present a memento to our guest. Thank you, sir. Uh,